I was watching the chat, so I'm not sure if Dottie, Dottie mentioned it, but we are recording. Um, so just so you're aware of that, and the recording will be available uh, to watch um, it um, on the CQII site. They'll have a, a link to it there. For today, our learning objectives are to review concepts related to methods of, in, of civic engagement and involvement, and uh, demonstrate a framework for selecting appropriate methods of involvement to improve quality of care. So remember, we're looking at this through a framework of quality improvement. Uh, discuss the role advocacy plays in improving health outcomes for people with HIV. Uh, learn the importance of evaluating partnerships and relationships as a criteria for selecting method of involvement, and then present strategies for successful advocacy. Next slide. And now we're, I'm going to turn it back over to Dottie, and she's going to talk about some methods for uh, uh, involvement of people with HIV. Excellent. Thank you so much. So let's talk a little bit about, next slide, please, the roads that we've taken. And this is the point where I need your help. So I want to know from you, how have you been involved in community decision, in the community decision making process? That's number one. How have you been involved? How have you been involved in the community decision-making process? And please feel free to utilize the chat. Jeremy, if you can help me with the chat um, so that way I can just focus on uh, my screen. How have you been involved, good folks? What roads have you taken to be a part of the community decision-making process? I have a better question since you're thinking about that, right? Um, I want to ask, what do you know about the history of how people living with HIV, HIV, excuse me, have been affecting change and made improvements in HIV care? So say I'm new to this process and I need your help to help me to understand the history and how people living with HIV have been impacted by the change and improvements made in HIV care. And I do apologize. We didn't we didn't let you know that this was going to be an interactive type of time today. So, having said that, it is an interactive time. Um, are we familiar with the history of how people living with HIV or people with HIV have been impacted by change? So we've got some comments in the chat. Thank you. Um, we've got um, on I on I am I don't. I'm sure I did not say that correctly, mm -hmm. saying being a peer navigator. Leandre saying, I was dashing like two weeks ago and I joined the protest for free healthcare in Getty Square. Mm -hmm. uh, um, from Mike, I've participated in many meetings and I've helped in documenting the process flow and barriers. Yes. Absolutely. And the things I, I don't know if we always realize just the impact of the work that we do as it relates to advocacy and quality improvement. I remember about 20 plus years ago, I had an opportunity to be a part of New Jersey's first statewide um, needs assessment. Right. And I remember being like young and um, <laughs> look, I remember being like young and not really understanding the process and how it will benefit those living or impacted by HIV and AIDS. And now 20 plus years later, I have an opportunity to serve as the senior community uh, planner for the HIV planning group. And I'm seeing the work that was done then and before and how it impacts the very lives of the people that we love, live and work for and with. So I wanted to just set that framework for us today as we continue our journey through this process of advocacy and quality improvement. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little bit about three methods of involvement. It's agitation, and many of you have seen this before, agitation, activism, as well as advocacy. Next slide. So when we look at the definitions, um, when we talk about agitation, it was actually developed in the 1600s. And we all know what a mob looked like then. Well, it's the same idea. 
there was a lot of anger because no one is listening. So the people start yelling louder. And this time it's really without pitchforks unless you make us. ACT UP used the same method of agitation to significantly advance uh, the people living with HIV movement. Uh, some communities take decade, uh, I'm sorry, take de decades to gain public attention and ACT UP was able to take us there in an instant. Then we see activism and basically the whole concept was developed by women demanding the right to vote through involvement of those who could vote um, to include them as well. They took to the streets to demonstrate and show how many uh, they were and what they wanted. And still to this day, the women's suffrage movement is credited with the establishment of foundational elements of activism still used today. And our community, which has many examples of activism, also drew upon some special talents in our community, which has been creative creativity and love. And together with those two things, we made the AIDS quilt. I don't know how many of you remember the AIDS quilt and it was done piece by piece and stitch by stitch. And the memory sewn into the story and displayed to remind everyone of what we were losing because of fear, because of stigma, and most of all, in action. And you think about advocacy, and we talk about advocacy uh, represent, represented the legal interest of their clients. They literally brought forth uh, the cause and helped us to uh, get us to a good outcome. The National Quality Center is an organization dedicated to helping Ryan White organizations learn to improve and sustain gains and much better outcomes for us all. The advocate, for a more data-driven approach to our healthcare. They advocate not only for our inclusion in the process, but also dedicate their own time and resources to meaningful involvement. We understand that grantees um, everywhere are little laboratories for quality in need of quality advocates. They need us to represent us. This sounds very familiar. I'm reminded of the early work of HIV where they talked about nothing for us without, what, what, is, the, what is the statement, Jeremy? Nothing about us without us is for us. I know you guys remember that, especially as it relates to the Denver principles in the early days of HIV. So I wanna ask what, next slide please, what is advocacy? What is advocacy? And advocacy involves promoting the interest or cause of someone or a group of people. An advocate is a person who argues for, recommends, or supports a cause um, or policy. Advocacy is also about helping people find their voice. And there are three types of advocacy. Self-advocacy, it's individual advocacy, as well as systems advocacy. And we're talking about a lot of, um, obviously, advocacy today. And I would be remiss to not mention um, just some of the things that we've gone through even since the pandemic. We've seen a lot of advocacy and a lot of um, some agitation happening, especially with the racial tension in our society. Um, and one thing that stands out to me is that when people don't feel heard, they yell. And sometimes it's verbally and sometimes it's behaviorally. So I want us just to remember that. Next slide, please. So here's the big thing. I need to ask you, and we're gonna um, ask that you respond by way of word cloud. Kamisha, are we still there in terms of the word cloud? I see you, okay. So okay, cool. So I wanna hear from you. What are some of the characteristics of an advocate? What are some of the characteristics of an advocate? So at this time, we I need you to write your responses in this yes. word cloud and the so information you, for this lesson on the screen. Yep. Yep. You text CQII to the number two two three three three, and then it'll give you a message saying you're in our poll, and you can just type the word, and then we'll start to see our responses on the screen. I also put the link in the chat if you wanted to use that as well on your computer. 
thank you so much for that journey. I appreciate that. I see some characteristics here on the screen. Oh, yes. The brave is getting larger. That means a couple of folks are saying the same thing. I see you, Carmen. You said well-informed. They are well-informed and they're goal-oriented. Thank you for that. I'm really loving these responses that are coming in. Yes, me too. There's some great. Yeah, we have about 30 more seconds, go folks. <laughs> Tasha, how are you making out today? Just give me a thumbs up. Just give, uh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> they're driven, they're caring. I see you, Carmen. Yes, 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 yes. We have about 10 more seconds, go folks. Nancy, you good today? Thumbs up. Okay. Dawn, is that you? I see you. Yes. Marcus, I love how you just put on your camera. Yes, Marcus. I see you as well. It's good to see you. Awesome. 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 So what I'm seeing here is um, we have some of the characteristics that you've come up with is determined and empathetic, brave, devoted, grounded, mind, wait, what, minded. Oh, grounded, minded, well, uh, will, willing, self, um, empathetic, speak, caring, humility, um, follows humility, courageous, love, eager, confidence, open, compassionate, passionate, empathy, selfless, listener, survivor. And then we see some things here in the chat and I just wanna reiterate, well-informed, being goal-oriented, inspiring, empowering, driven, and caring. And I thank you so much for your, uh, the, for your participation in the word cloud. Because when I think about a lot of the movements that we've either experienced or we've read about, it takes these particular characteristics for folks to really um, advocate for the needs of others. Thinking about the work that you do, and I wanted to highlight, because I saw in the chat, I want to say it was Nancy, when you talked about being blessed to be part of an organization that has served your area for 25 years and that you've recently been placed in this position of linkage to care and you're trying to find new ways to reach out of care and less adherent patients to engage them back in their care and develop a trusting relationship between them and the healthcare team. So what I'm seeing here, Nancy, is being the liaison between folks who are out of care and the healthcare system. And I think about some of the characteristics that it takes to be a good advocate. So being able to be empathetic and being caring and being community oriented and compassionate and being able to speak to both sides as we're advocating for our clients who may be or patients who are out of care. So I see you and I thank you, Nancy, for that. So when we talk up now, just now we talked about the characteristics of an advocate, right? But we're gonna take this a little bit further and we're going to talk a little bit, actually Jeremy is going to talk to us about like advocacy and quality, like why advocacy for quality, Jeremy? Yeah, so thank you, Dottie, and thank you all for those, you know, um, amazing responses. Those were all great characteristics of an advocate. Um, so why do we use advocacy when we're talking about quality improvement? Um, if you think about quality improvement, we look often at incremental changes. You know, how can we move the needle to get, uh, improve the patient experience, to get better health outcomes? Um, Often that means not taking drastic changes all at once. So where do we make those small changes to make those improvements that are lasting? So when we're talking about advocacy, we're talking about, um, you know, usually that's done in teams, right? You know, it's, it's not done, you know, obviously there can be a quality advocate, but you need others around you. You need the ability to build relationships and build partnerships 
um, to make those improvements. And as you know, Dottie said earlier, advocacy is data driven. And by data, we're not necessarily meaning just the numbers, not just that quantitative data of values and, 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 um, and outcomes, but also our qualitative data. What are the impressions and the feelings and the, the observations of those uh, that we are advocating for? That needs to be brought in as well. So that's when we're looking at advocacy work for quality improvement, advocacy is often the choice that we use. Next slide. So we all know intake forms are not the favorite. We all know that. Um, is this really the best involvement method to solve this particular problem, right? Is this the, do we, um, obviously this is the, Dottie referred to the pitchforks, right? This is the agitation stage. Is this really the appropriate method? So one of the things that we talk about for quality improvement is do we don't go to this, we don't want to go to the extremes, the extreme measures to improve a simple problem. So we want to use our appropriate uh, tools and resources and how, how we solve a problem is not the same as whether it is improved. Um, and what happens if we agitate and we, or, you know, our, our clients refuse the form, um, then, you know, it, the form is changed or removed, and then we lose important information uh, that would, that doesn't get gathered. And how do we, can we then make informed decisions? So we have to think about, depending on the problem, depending on the issue, the concern, what is that appropriate me uh, method? Next slide. We're going to talk a little bit about what quality advocates are. So you gave great um, examples of what an advocate is, but when you're talking about quality advocates, there's some other things that we we look for as well. So the first is you're looking at self-managing patients, patients who know the system, patients who can read the system, who um, know how to navigate it, because they often know the barriers and how they overcame them. Um, that they're comfortable with data. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're experts. Uh, they don't have to know all the ins and outs. They don't have to be a data analyst, but they're comfortable looking at it and reviewing it. They're effective communicators. They're able to get their point across or their idea across to others. They're also able to bring in others to those conversations. They're comfortable with technology. They're also effective and supportive team members. So remember, it's all about those partnerships and building those teams. And then they're quality improvement literate. So they know um, a little bit about quality improvement and what those principles are. And then there's other characteristics on here. We've already talked about some of them in your word in the word cloud. Um, I would add, and I saw this on the word cloud, a listener. They're a good listener. They're able to hear what's going on in the community and translate that into the work that they're advocating for, the changes they're advocating for. Uh, next slide. So and then um, we're talking about how do we partner to improve? Um, actually, we can go to the next slide, Kamisha. So when we're selecting a method of involvement, this is kind of the, this is the process. So think about that intake form again as we're going through this a little bit. What is the problem? Is the, is the form too long? Is it asking redundant questions? Is it taking too much time for the front office to enter or the client to, um, to complete, like what is, the, what is the problem we're trying to solve with this? And then identify stakeholders, who should be involved in those conversations. Oftentimes when we're talking about um, improving something, we don't, all, we don't always include that front office staff member who is doing the work of it, um, uh, getting intake forms done or entering that data. So you want them involved, you want your data person involved to make sure we're collecting the right thing, but you also want people who are filling those forms out involved. You want their voice, right? You need to hear what their concerns are, what their observations are about the form. And then examine those relationships. What, um, what relationships need to be built? Um, what trust needs to be developed so that you can get the right people to the table? And then determine what the appropriate response is. Um, where do we go from here? What's the next steps, right? 
and then select your method of involvement. Which method will bring the best outcome? As we were talking about with that, last, that slide about this intake form must go, um, agitation, or agitation and activism might not be the best response. Advocacy is the better response in that case. That's not always the case. We know that. We've seen that in the last year and a half with, all of, with everything going on in the world. Advocacy is not always the appropriate response. But often when we're talking about quality improvement, it, it, it is the best method. Next slide. So this was um, this uh, webinar uh, was designed for um, people with HIV to learn more about advocacy. Um, so when you're advocating, we have to remember that we are advocating for improvements in HIV care and services, and you are advocating and often speaking for your community and those we're serving. So always keep that in mind. Yes, you know your personal experience, but you're also speaking. Oftentimes when we're, we're, in the, we're in the room, people think we are speaking for everyone living with HIV. So I've been in that situation before as someone living with HIV. Um, people think that when I talk, sometimes I'm talking, for, I'm, or I'm talking for the whole community. So we need to keep that in mind. My experience is not your experience. So we just need to keep that, um, at the forefront of our minds when we're talking and that we're making sure that we're bringing the right people to the table too and gathering as much information from other points of view and bringing that with us. And now um, we've got a few more questions for you. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, as we go through these or drop your um, uh, answers in the chat. Next slide. So how does this framework of involvement help to achieve uh, better, help to better achieve community goals. What are your thoughts on that? So when you're thinking about the three types of um, advocacy, right? We think about activism, we think about agitation, and what's the third one, Jeremy? Activism. Agitation and... Activism and advocacy and advocacy, right? So when we think about that, agitation, activism, and advocacy, I wanna understand from you or hear from you all, how does this framework and thinking about quality, how does this framework of involvement help to better achieve community goals? You all are quiet today. Okay, I had to, I had to shut my door. Oh, <laughs> hey, Will, work. how are you? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. How's everyone? Good, good. Uh, with me being an advocate, um, you know, advocating is pretty much what I do. But a lot of times to get your point across is you have to shake the table just a little bit, just a little bit mm -hmm. uh, to kind of get your, your point across. Um, because what people don't, a lot of people don't understand is that you're talking from personal experiences. And uh, a lot of times when your clients come to you, uh, you're the, your client's voice. And a lot of times uh, they don't have that support system or no one is uh, talking for them. So that's where your job becomes very important. And like Jeremy said, uh, you have to determine <laughs> which one is appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the situation, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a lot of times, like, for instance, if someone hasn't turned in paperwork to receive their meds, then that's when uh, you advocate. Uh, now, if someone, uh, like, say, for instance, a performance team decides that, okay, well, we're not giving them emergency meds, okay, you can advocate and then kind of agitate, like shake the table a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I do it quite a bit. So, uh, yeah, so this framework, this framing work helps me in my day-to-day -day position. So, uh, and you can, that's uh, the reason of quality. Uh, you know, helping us be able to pretty much uh, get our clients engaged. So uh, 
That's a good question. Mm -hmm. And you know, well, as you were speaking, I was thinking about when you talked about uh, the client who, um, you know, doesn't have access to medication, right? And now if we're seeing that mm -hmm. with a large part of our client population, that can be a quality issue, right? It may not just be, oh, this person didn't submit their paperwork in on time. It may be a lot of red tape uh, that prevents clients from getting what they need or pay up. Uh, preventing our folks from getting what they need, right? So it's like, when I begin to look at that, and I remember doing um, HIV case management um, definitely many years ago, and when I would see some issues within the system, now we need to talk about the system. It's not just isolated incidents, right? It's, okay, a lot of my clients are dealing with this, and what do I need to do in order to uh, streamline this process so that my folks can get what they need? Right. And I love what you said about agitation. Sometimes you have to come in and shake the table a little bit. Sometimes you have to say, listen, this is an issue here. And we this is a, a, a cause for concern. How do we handle this? Right. So I appreciate that in terms of shaking the table. I like a good table shaking. <laughs> yes, I and do. At, especially when we're so big on virus suppression. So how can we sit up there and get to that point where everybody is virally suppressed? Yeah. And it's an issue with paperwork and you're not giving them the medication that's needed to stay in care. Mm -hmm. So th that's that's a big issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we first of all, thank you for that. Will. I appreciate that. Um, I think we have some some conversations in the chat. Jeremy. Yeah. So we've got um, from Mike. Uh, he said a little more. Oh, no, sorry. Um, find others who may also be in the same place and can share uh, like experiences to show where improvement can be achieved. You know, getting involved uh, speaks a lot. It's like love in action. Mm -hmm. And then we've got from uh, Roshana, we have this framework makes quality improvement eff efforts more practical and more related to client day-to-day -day needs. And uh, from Don, um, who is a strong quality advocate um, uh, and, and does that work as part, first as part of CQII, uh, said as advocates, we are able to assist a uh, patient with stigma issues, um, being voiced to educate those who are, 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 are doing it. Um, I uh, recently did a, a, a training um, for um, PWH in our area here on self-advocacy. And one of the things we talked about is, you know, again, they were talking about building your relationship with your provider. And sometimes, I mean, sometimes, yes, you, you do have to stand up and say, you know, this is not right, this is what I need, and you have to agitate. But sometimes, you know, when you're building those relationships, it's all about um, communicating um, and with your provider or with the person you're advocating um, to in a way that brings them to the table, that makes them, a, you know, um, more willing to listen to. So I used a, a picture of uh, Pooh Bear with some honey. Um, you know, sometimes we have to sweeten the pot a little bit or sweeten our tone a little bit to get them to listen and get them to um, do that. I think both methods are needed. Um, both things are needed. It just depends on the time and what you're trying to accomplish, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what, Dawn, I don't want, I want to call you in for a minute. Because I, I want to hear more about being a voice to educate those, especially as it relates to stigma. Can you just unmute if you can and, and give voice to that? So when I say that, I say it because it makes me remember back to there was a time. So I'm a patient adherence specialist in my clinic. Mm -hmm. So basically I work with the patients who have been lost to care and maybe not coming to their appointments and just helping with any other barriers that they're having. And I had a client who was having a baby. She had not disclosed to her family. Um, anyone, she didn't, no one knew except for me in the clinic, basically. And she was having a baby and her mother was gonna be in the delivery room with her. And she had been having a hard time with this, this hospital about you know, them telling her basically, you need to just tell your mother because we can't guarantee that we won't mention during the, the delivery process that you're positive. And so she, you know, asked me, can you please come with me? Because I, you know, if they tell her my mother's going to disown me, she's going to kick me out. So I actually had to go into the delivery room with her during the process of her being in labor. And I had to have these conversations about, you know, you, this, you, you can't tell somebody when they tell they're positive. 
you know, I had a nurse say to her, well, if you wasn't doing what, what you were supposed to be doing, you wouldn't be in this situation. And so, you know, that conversation got really a little crazy, but I was just there to be her voice and make sure that they didn't say anything that they shouldn't say. I got the the AZT tag taken off of her um, IV line that was in her because her mother was, you know, asking questions. And so, you know, I was able to be her voice for her, mm -hmm. you know, and, and educate some of the nurses who, you know, obviously acted like they didn't know what HIPAA was. So, yeah. Yes. Wow. And I'm even thinking about, first of all, thank you so much for sharing that, Dawn. And as you were speaking, I'm thinking about like this time of giving birth is supposed to be, of course, it's a scary time, but like a joyous time. And then the added layer of the fact that my status may be disclosed to my family who doesn't know puts a lot of pressure and anxiety in the mix, right? Okay. So on top of being inappropriate and going against him. I mean, we can go so many places with that. And when I think about it from a quality standpoint, what could be done? Is this individual or is this, could this be like an, not an organizational issue, but how do we stop this from happening? Right? No, and it could be an organ, it could be organizational and personal. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I did have to write a letter to, to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I told them, maybe I need more training, up-to-date training. Mm -hmm. So it could be both. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think far as it possibly being a QI project, I mean, you know, I can even think about my own clinic. You know, we, you know, we do things like we had a project that we did and I kind of spearheaded it, but we had clients, as soon as they came in the door, we had them fill out this, it was like a comic card that they took with them along their visit. Mm -hmm. From the time they walked in to the time they went to the desk, um, how long it took to wait for them to go in. Once they go in, they went into the room and spoke with the nurse doing their intake. When the doctor came in, how long it took for them to come in and do the blood work. You know, the whole process, how did it make you feel? What areas do you think need to be changed to make this experience better for you? And so we got a lot of input on that and some changes were made, so, you know. I'm done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I'm here for it all. Thank you so much, Dawn, for that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Just talking about even the process and how do we improve the quality of the services that we're delivering to our folks? And what I heard Will say earlier is that um, even in answering the second question, does our HIV community use all the methods appropriately and effectively? And, and what I heard Will say is that sometimes it takes, listen, I'm, I may come in as an advocate, like you said, Dawn, and have conversations with the nurse and, and the other um, healthcare professionals and maybe suggest some trainings. But then there's some times that I may need to like shake the table a little bit in terms of um, taking my advocacy to that next level. Maybe I need to do some agitation. Um, here uh, to get the attention of the folks. Jeremy, I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead, Will. Let me let me add something too. Uh, things can be changed from the beginning. It's it's all about how you engage your clients in the beginning. Mm -hmm. If they're treated with respect and the dignity and the quality is excellent, then you would keep them engaged in care. If uh, like say for instance, someone is newly diagnosed and you're rushing them through the process and you're not explaining, you're not giving them HIV one-on-one, -on -one, nothing, you're just saying, okay, well, you're positive, the health department is going to contact you. They're not understanding that, you know? And so like here at my agency, that's why I say it's important when someone finds out that they're positive, have someone uh, like an advocate in there to make sure that they get the appointment as quickly as possible, yes. make sure that they can get their intake done as quickly as possible and have someone, a face, to say, okay, it's going to be okay. We, I'm, I'm positive, and you're going to be all right. So I'm going to walk you through the process. I'm going to be your support system. You can call me if you need me to talk to whoever you, you want me to talk to. When you're ready, I can even help you disclose. You know, things like that to reassure that they're going to be okay. But when you, someone is finding out that they're positive, and then they have an appointment that's two or three weeks out, and no one is calling to check on them, you're giving them too much time to think. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that they're thinking about is the negative uh, aspect of what's attached to being positive, mm -hmm. because no, they don't have an example to go by. Right. So uh, I agree with Don. I believe once you said it, it's it's 
is how the staff, the doctors, the nurses, if you don't, because a lot of them, that's not their specialty. So they're just as frightened as the person that just found out that they was positive. Mm -hmm. And they're and and the client can feel that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Will. Jeremy. Oh, sorry. I was um I was gonna did we we so we talked about a little bit about does you know our HIV community use all the methods appropriately and effectively? And I think, you know, as Dottie said, Will touched on that. Um and you know, I think we've got room to improve there. We've got some quality improvement to do on that as well about um, uh, if we're using them correctly and effectively. Um, because sometimes maybe we're taking too soft of approach or sometimes we're, we're not taking soft enough approach or, or what we do when we're depending on, uh, on the tactic um, or in the um, strategy. strategy, correct. Thank you, uh, Adi. Um, Kamisha, can you pull up the next question as well? So how might this framework change our activities in relationship to improving HIV care uh, through partnerships with providers? So I talked a little bit about, about that um, myself and you know, for when I'm at self-advocacy training I did, but when we're talking about improving for our community, um, how does that framework of advocacy um, in quality improvement uh, change how we you know, relate to um, um, and build those partnerships, right? those partnerships are really important when we're talking about making those changes, right? So um, does anybody have any further thoughts on that before we, we um, move on in the presentation? This is Mike. One thing I'm hearing, and Will, I'm really glad what you, uh, what you said, it sounds like more partnerships between peer navigators, peers in general, need to occur, whether it's with somebody new or somebody who may be coming back, uh, you know, the second or third time. If we're losing people to care, then they need, they need a peer advocate. They need someone to help work with them. Whereas oftentimes we find, oh, show up for your appointment, sit, sit in a, a waiting room by yourself. Don't talk to anybody until somebody calls you that just may not be the way to go anymore. I so, I so agree with you on that. And I think, um, so if that's the change that we need to happen, if that's the change we need to move to is to having more peers, how do we affect that? Um, how as a quality effect, advocate do you affect that? Who's making the decision to get more peers involved? So that's the thing, it's not usually the peers, right? Um, it's not usually us. So how do we work through this framework of advocacy to get the right people to the table that can make those decisions to bring more peers on? And both, you know, Mike, you, you just said you were talking about that and, and Will was touching on that as well about having a peer there when someone's newly diagnosed, right? How do we get more peers involved? Um, oftentimes, you, you, know, you have to advocate for that with the people who make those decisions. Mm -hmm. I think Will had his hand up and I see Dawn has something in the chat. Go ahead, Will. Uh, one thing that I am realizing is, is funding. A lot of times uh, when these positions are created, they have more than one person doing the same job. Like for instance, uh, for someone that's newly diagnosed resistant to care or out of care, uh, that's where the prayer advocate comes in. But then also you have an outreach worker that's working and is allowed to set appointments and all that. And then you have the linkage to current coordinator that's engaging with. So it's it's like, who do you call? I mean, we're all doing the same job. So, okay, what do I need to do at this point? So that that's another issue that I see that a lot of agencies are facing because you have four or five people doing the same job. So that sounds like an exciting quality improvement project to align those policies and and procedures to make sure we're not duplicating efforts and that clients know who their contact is right who so they're not confused i think that you you hit right on it like there's often confusion about who do i reach out to them right when i've got an issue so absolutely absolutely and i want to say that 
John talked about uh, that can possibly happen through um, CAD. Did you want to speak to that, John? No, I was just saying that through, you said, you know, how, how do we get the peer advocates, you know, inside the agencies to do these things? And I said, you know, sometimes when agencies have cabs, you know, the people living with that are on these cabs can speak to this because maybe they know that, you know, they had a peer come in the room and assist them and maybe there's not one on staff anymore. Um, you know, I remember when I first started working here, there was no peer and um you know i would meet with the patients that, when they were newly diagnosed i would be the first person they see after they get their diagnosis and then the doctor would come in um they may not see the care coordinator or the medical case manager until the next visit so they don't get overwhelmed and then to what will said you know how do they know who to contact i think that's an agency you know like uh jeremy said you know the policies because like i work here under a grant and it's called the RAP grant the retention and adherence. So there's myself, retention specialist and an adherence specialist. So I'm the peer, you know, so they call me when they need support or maybe they can't reach their retention specialist who helps them with appointments, sets up appointments. Um, and the adherence specialist is the person they call when they have medication issues. So making clear roles on what each person does so that the client knows who to call for what is a big issue, I think, too, also, like uh, Will said. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And then what I, what's coming to mind for me as we go to the next slide is making sure that we had evidence by way of data to influence what it is that we do. Again, is this an individual? Or is it something that's ha happening across the organization? Jeremy, take us into this one person can change the course of HIV. So this is a, a, a favorite quote of mine, um, a favorite quote of, of CQII's as well. Um, you know, it's a Mother Teresa quote. Um, we see, our, we ourselves feel that we are do, that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean, but the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. So sometimes it just takes one voice it just takes one person um, coming, uh, having an idea or one person uh, starting the conversation to make the changes that need to happen. Um, we have uh, about 13 minutes left of your time and we've got a few more uh, uh, things to get through. So we're gonna um, move on and Dottie's gonna talk about elements of uh, successful advocacy. Yeah, so let's look at the strategy, shall we? Next slide, strategies for successful advocacy. So the first one that I wanted to just point out, and, and, and we've mentioned this in the work that we, we do, we talked about attitudes and emotions, right? And I've learned just by talking to people that even when I'm emotional or passionate about something, I have to make sure that my tone is correct. So that means that I'm not yelling, right? That I have to like drop my voice when I feel anger. And especially Especially depending on who I'm speaking with, I need to make sure that what I'm saying is getting across and folks are not getting caught up in the emotion of it all. Um, I, when I think about flexibility, the next um, bullet here is really just to keep an open mind. And what I understand is that locking down really invites resistance. And just to give you a heads up, this information that we're presenting as it relates to the strategy, um, most of the information is taken from the Partners Resource Network, which is a nonprofit agency that operates out of Texas. Um, and it's really about parents. Uh, it's a parenting training information center, and it's really helping parents to advocate for their children who may experience or have disabilities. But I think the same tools and strategies apply to the work that we do. So the flexibility part of it all is really Ha opening up ourselves to invite dialogue, which invites creativity. Um, the, sec the third one is determination. So again, flexibility is how a problem gets solved, but it's not the same as whether it gets solved, right? So when we talk about determination, not everything is worth going to war for. I remember in early stages of advocacy, uh, a lot of the folks that were in the field before me would ask me the question, is this the hill that you want to die on today? And if that's not, I see some folks are smiling because it resonates with them as well. Is this the hill that, you're, that you wanna die on today? And some things I had to understand to really pick my battles. Is everything worth fighting for? Is everything worth fighting for? And this, I love this part, the create a paper trail. Um, even if you remember what people said, write it down. 
I also have done some work at the state level concerning um, child welfare. I've done a lot of training and curriculum development for about 12 years. And I remember we would say, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So this is some of the same methods that we take into our advocacy. And then we think about knowledge, being clear in communicating the area of concern, keeping it short and simple, creating an outline that includes the issues and the strategies that work, and also include the support network to help you. We're not an island. Right, And so it's not just about me going up to the uh, legislator's office, but how do I leverage the networks that I'm connected to to impact change. Uh, and then we have prepare, prepare, prepare. And Jeremy, I'm going to throw the ball to you as it relates to prepare, prepare, prepare. We added this one. This is not from the, the resources. We added this one because this is really important. Um, you have to, you know, you know, create your own, your plan and keep revising it for what you're, you're trying to accomplish, what you're advocating for. Um, one of the things we say is tell stories, not statements. So use your story, um, use the story of uh, the individuals that you're, that you're serving um, to uh, advocate for that change, right? People often are led by emotion, even though they may not show it. Right, they if they can feel it, they'll uh, be more likely to be um, receptive to the idea of, of the change and leverage those established relationships. So really build those relationships, um, and then you know, as Dottie said, you know, persuade people, open-ended conversations, right, um, allowing that creativity to happen. And then one of the things. Um, that um, I like to tell people is prepare your elevator pitch. Sometimes all you have with someone to talk about the change that you're, you're looking for is by passing them in the hallway. Um, and you all may only have 30 to 60 seconds, that, you know, ele that time of an elevator ride. So prepare um, that and practice that so you're ready when it's time and you get the opportunity. Um, so um, an if you're not familiar with an elevator pitch, it's, it's 60 seconds, like I said, it's the first 10 seconds are about who you are. Um, and then the next like 40 seconds are about the problem. So why you're talking to them, what are you seeing um, that's happening in the community or what is the issue that you're wanting to propose a change for? And then, and then 10 seconds for your ask. What's your simple ask? Like, what can we, what can we do to make this improvement? Um, have those, have that ready. If you know and you're seeing something that needs to be changed, have that ready so that you can talk to that and speak to that and you're prepared so that uh, people can um, really grasp your story and then are left with the impression and know that it's coming back, right? It's coming back and they need to, they need to address it. And you know what, Jeremy, may I add something here? Because I see a lot in terms of the cabs and how cabs have definitely fallen um, apart. I see you, uh, Mike, that talks about the cab interests are low and where you are, Carmen, as well. You talked about that, especially with patients who have other uh, like medical issues and um, you know because of COVID. So we see a lot of that happening um, in the work that we do. And this is why it's so important when we talk about Carmen about engaging patients who are already, it's hard to, it's difficult to engage patients who are already going through. And I want us to be mindful, even as we continue to do the advocacy work as it relates to quality improvement, let's remember to, um, we have folks coming behind us and let us always remember to teach as we're learning to teach others. Because when we're done with this particular process, we need other people that's going to continue to carry this uh, when we have retired and we're done with this particular work. So that's why it's important as we're advocating, we're building up other advocates too. Because when I retire, good folks, <laughs> yes, Dawn, share, share, share. When I retire, when I'm just like, kind of like over this particular um, type of work, or sometimes we can get burnt out. We need to make sure that we are building up other advocates as well and giving them the tools and the skill set to carry this on. Jeremy, I'm throwing the ball back to you because I like to play ball. <laughs> and I would just add to that, um, if you're newer to, to advocacy um, or you're, you're, you know, you're working to train up others who are newer in advocacy, it's important to give yourself grace. Um, 
when when you when you're starting out with anything, a new um, a new hobby or a, a, a new a new job, it's important to remember that it takes practice. Um, you're not always going to get it right the first time. That don't but don't let that discourage you. Um, I know I've. <clears throat> I've made plenty of mistakes when advocating for things and 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 went the wrong route um, and I've had to had to go back and examine what I did um, and improve that so it's just important give yourself grace in this right and especially you know, when we are dealing with um, clients who are experiencing a lot of barriers and we're trying to advocate for them we can't always accomplish them all at once right so where where do we prioritize and how do we do that um, so just, you know, kind of think through those things as you're, as you're preparing to advocate for others. Excellent. Excellent. I just want to ask you folks, what questions do you have? I see Marcos and Nancy and Tasha. I see Carmen. I feel like the uh, romper room. That might be a Jersey thing. But Nancy, I see you. Talk to me. Um, I just wanted to share, you know, being new to this linkage to care position with our organization is something that, like I said, I'm completely blessed to be a part of. And um, like you're saying, advocating and, and sharing stories and just being there. Um, I had a new patient last week, young 22 year old gentleman came in um, a nervous wreck, just a ball of nerves, you could tell. And by the time he left, he felt a thousand times lighter, just knowing that we were, we were here, we were gonna do what we could, everything in our power, all the services that we offer um, between our Ryan White services to our food pantry to being able to help him get his own insurance plan so his dad wouldn't find out on his insurance that he still had. Because um, I think that's really where he was struggling with himself, you know, and, and just letting him know that we're not going to force you. You don't have to tell if you're not ready. Um, but here's what we can do. Let's go this route. And if that's, you know, and he just you know, he kind of opened up and started, you know, knowing that he was going to be okay. And so I think that was kind of one of my first success stories, knowing that we were able to provide that peace for him, even if just a little bit in his world of chaos at the moment. Um, you know, it was nice. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you so much. Just not only just sharing that, but taking the time to journey with that young man through his process, because it is hard. And like you said, him having to just deal with the new information of his health status, of his HIV status. And then on top of that, like what happens if my parents find out and not knowing the dynamics of that situation. Okay. So you're journeying with him, helping him to feel like okay, I can do this until he's ready, right? Because that's, it's a, it's a pro disclosure is a process. Yeah. Understanding this HIV disease is a process. Yeah. So I want to say thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. And like I said, you're right. No, not knowing the dynamics of, of his family life and everything, it's mm -hmm. hard to, to play that dance around, you know, with them because we're in Western Kentucky. We're in the part of, you know, just a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of people that still, you know, and, and I don't use ignorant lightly, but not knowing is ignorance and having that education out there and being able to, to provide that, that's, you know, another part of what we do and, you know, just opening that door and, and educating people would help alleviate a lot of things. And that's where, you know, I feel proud to be able to provide that for our clients that do come in through the door. Mm -hmm. so. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Good folks, it is 2.58. Jeremy, what else do we have to say in these two minutes? Thank you. <laughs> um, I think thank you for, for joining us today. We hope that you um, are walking away with uh, some new knowledge or uh, something that, that's helpful for you in the work that you do and advocating for the people that you that you work so hard for every day. Um, uh, I'm constantly inspired by uh, people uh, like you from across the country that are doing this work and, and, and standing in the gap for, for clients, continue to do the amazing things that you're doing. And um, we just, you know, thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, I'm sure we'll see you all again. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, everybody. Have an amazing day. NBC. We should say oh. as well, sorry, that there is another um, webinar webinar coming up in two weeks. Kanisha, do you have the yeah. details on that? Yeah, so that's the one that we're going to do on June 24th. It's going to be at 
3 p.m. if I'm going to check the time right now, actually 2 p.m. Um, it's going to be on engaging um, persons with HIV and quality. And our presenter is um, Tom Cantana, who's with the RAC Corporation. And he'll just be coming and presenting to us some strategies, some tips, some things that we've learned over their um, years of research around um, engaging persons who have experienced in quality. So that, um, that announcement is going to go out as well. And um, please join us if you're able to, June 24th at 2 p.m. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, everybody. Have an amazing day.